Right, some more integration uh, today, I'm afraid, this lesson. Um, we've looked at basic integration and uh, we have keep reminding ourselves that when we do this integration we have to put a plus C at the end and that makes it uh, an indefinite integral because we don't know what C is. We're now going to um, tighten things up a little bit and make our answers actually not have the plus C in. In other words, it's going to give us a, a definite integral. So we're going to look at what the concept of definite integration is all about. So a definite integral, first of all, has two numbers at the top and bottom of the integral sign. These numbers are referred to as limits. This one is the upper limit and this one is the lower limit. Most of the work, in fact it's probably safe to say all of the work that you do uh, at AS level, um, this number will be smaller than that number, but it doesn't have to be. So it's not called upper and lower because that number's bigger than this, it's called upper because it's at the top of the integral sign. Now, I'm only going to demonstrate the process and you're going to learn how to do the process. I'm not going to prove what this uh, stands for, but I will show you what it stands for. We'll look at a, a, a later lesson at a little demonstration proof of what's actually going on. Um, now, the first thing you do is to do the integral. So, 2x cubed over 3 plus x squared over 2. Now this time, because it's a definite integral, we don't put in the plus c. Instead, we put a set of square brackets. So it's an absolutely conventional notation. This isn't my notation, it's convention, you have to do it this way. And we take the limits and again we put them this time on the other side, again that's the convention. Don't ask yourself why, this is just the way it's evolved. They're put there. Now it's important to realise that these two numbers tie up with the dx. Now remember that the dx is there to tell you which is the variable letter. And if it wasn't there, and there were other letters floating around here, you wouldn't know which the variable letter was. So it's crucial that to have that dx there. And these two numbers here are actually values of x. We don't write in x equals 2, but you need to remember that these are values of x. What do we do with those values of x? Well, we substitute them into here. And you work with the top number first. So you put x equals 2 into this. So you get 2 times 2 cubed over 3 plus 2 squared over 2. You then take the second value of x and you substitute it in for x. So 2 times 1 cubed over 3 plus 1 squared over 2. And then the important bit to remember is you subtract. So it's first subtract the second. Now, depending on which exam board you're taking, you may be using a, a non-calculator -calcula paper or a calculator paper. If you're uh, taking a board with a, without a calculator, the numbers they will give you will be pretty, pretty easy. If you're doing one where you need a calculator, the numbers might be a little bit harder than this. And then you work this out. 8 times 2 is 16 over 3 plus 4 over 2, which is 2, take away 1 times 2 is 2 over 3, plus a half. 
Now, if I was doing this, I would be saying, well, I'll put the thirds together. So 16 over 3 take away 2 over 3 is 14 over 3. To take away a half is 1 and a half. So 2 times 14 is 28. 3 times 3 is 9 over a common denominator of 6. Gives us the final answer of 28 and 9, 37 over 6, which is 6 and 1, 6. And that is the answer to the definite integral. So this definite integral gives us an answer of 6 and 1 sixth. No x is in the answer, no plus c's, just a numerical answer. OK, fair enough. It's a process you could obviously uh, carry out. But what have we done? What have we found? Well, we've actually found something pretty surprising, really, because if we look at the graph of this function, then it looks something like, uh, I think it goes down a bit like this and comes up again like that. Y and X. And the two values of X, 1 and 2. What about those two values of X? Well, if I draw a straight line up to the graph, Believe it or not, I have just found that area. So a definite integral gives us the area underneath a graph between my two limits. So another way of explaining lower and upper is the beginning of the area and the end of the area. Now, when this method was first discovered, I mean, this is pretty, pretty incredible because this is not a straight line, this top uh, edge. It's a sort of curve, well, it's a parab parabola. And so for the first time, uh, people had a, a systematic way of finding the area of shapes that had curved sides rather than straight sides. And apart from the circle that they'd sort of mas mastered by then, uh, this was uh, a tremendous breakthrough. So the method looks pretty, pretty easy. So let's look at where things uh, can start to go wrong. Okay, we we'll pause it there. Thank you. And right, let's. I think let's just write a little summary of that at the moment uh, before we we try the next example. So what I've done then, I'm saying that if I work out the integral of a function of x between a and b. This is the area between the graph y equals function x, the x-axis, and the lines x equals a, and x equals b. OK. Is there any problem with that? Well, let's look at this one. 2 to 3, x squared minus 5x plus 6. <clears throat> Carry out the integration. x cubed over 3 minus 5x squared over 2 plus 6x, don't worry about plus c, limits on the other side. Substitute in the numbers. 3 cubed over 3, that's 27 over 3, which is 9. Minus 3 squared is 9. 9 fives are 45. 45 over 2 is 22 and a half. 3 is 18, 3 sixes. OK, take away, put in 2, 8 over 3, 
Uh, four fives are twenty over two is take away ten plus twelve. Eighteen and nine, twenty seven. Take away twenty two and a half is four and a half. And then this one here, try to keep these numbers in my head. Twelve take away ten is two. And eight over three is two and two thirds. So four and two thirds. And depending on how good you are at fractions, that's four and three sixths. Take away four and four sixths. Oh, that looks a problem, doesn't it? It's a minus a six that's come out too. Now, up here, I said this gives me the area. Down here, I've got a negative. How can I have a negative area? Well, look at the graph. If we sketch this graph, it's a very well-known quadratic that we've lo worked with loads of times. It goes through 2 and 3. So, of course, my limits were actually the place where the graph crossed the axis. So, between the graph and the x-axis means we're down here. So, not only does it give me the area, it tells me whether the graph is above or below the axis. So, all this negative sign here does is to tell you that the graph or the area is below the x-axis. Now that's crucial to understand that because often the exam question is trying to catch you out um, as we'll look at uh, in the next situation that we have. Right, so Let's just keep this in mind then about the, the negativeness and we'll look at uh, negative 1 to 1 of x cubed minus x. So do the integral, x to the 4 over 4 minus x squared over 2 between minus 1 and 1. Pop the numbers in, 1 to the 4 is 1. 1 squared is 1. Take away. Now, negative 1 to the 4 is still 1. And negative 1 squared is still 1. And so, if you look at that, I mean, both the square brackets are the same, so that if we subtract, the whole thing's going to come to naught. Does that mean we've got no area? Well, of course, it doesn't, because if you were to sketch this particular graph, you will find that it does something like that, minus 1, 0, 1. So my definite integral is this, and the top part is positive, the bottom part is negative, the whole thing is symmetrical, uh, the areas on each side. One is above, one is below, and so they cancel out to give us zero area. And so if you wanted to do a question like this, it's absolutely vital that you understand that you would have to do this in two parts. So you would have to do the integral from minus 1 to naught of x cubed minus x dx, and then you'd have to do the integral from 0 to 1 of x cubed minus x. And to get the area of the whole lot, because this is going to come out negative, you actually would have to subtract it to, uh, to turn it into a positive number. And of course, because each area is um, the same, um, you just look at... Uh, one part uh, like this, 
and double it so uh, so the area would finally come out to be a positive uh, number okay so be on your guard then with this it's uh, tricky and the exam will try and catch you out but very often uh, certainly my experience looking at uh, the questions they do give you a diagram and the, so at least you're being warned in advance. Okay, so we've looked there then at the, the basic idea of definite integration and what the limits mean and what the definite integral itself means. So in the next lesson we're going to look at just a slightly more complicated scenario surrounding these ideas. So let's have a look at this one. So solve x plus 2x equals 12. So what do you think you do first? Okay, well, I want x on its own. So I would put x equals 12 minus 2x. Okay, so a lot of the time we want to get x by itself. But what we want to do first is get all of these x's together. So can you see anything we can do with this? Get all these together in one place. Oh, okay, it's 3x, isn't it? Yeah, so absolutely. So 3x equals 12. Oh, and so x equals 4. Brilliant, spot on, well done.